uh, we began our countdown with a story that you chose as number 10. It's a story of two newlyweds whose time together was cut short by tragedy. News Channel 7's Morgan Kirkland has that story. Buck Story and Tasha Bradford got married at High Praise Worship Center in Panama City, then set out on their honeymoon to Gatlinburg, Tennessee. They were driving home early on the morning of October 27th when their world turned upside down. Story lost control of their car on Interstate 185 near LaGrange, Georgia. All I can remember is waking up to the car rolling, and then the next thing I know, um, I'm kind of, you know, mangled in the car. Story died at the scene. Bradford survived. But surgeons at Grady Memorial Hospital in Atlanta had to amputate her right leg, remove half her colon and part of her intestine to save her life. At first she was in critical condition, so they said it was either her life or her leg. I was okay with it, and I'm still okay with it. Bradford is back in Panama City at Health South Rehab Hospital. She's standing with the help of a walker. After a few more months of rehab, doctors say she'll learn to use a prosthesis. In time, they expect her to make a full recovery. Although her husband is gone, Bradford's family says he's not forgotten. I believe that if they, if Buck had the option, that um, it would have been this way, that he would have gone and she would have stayed. Um, just because of his love for her, you know, he would have done anything. In Panama City, Morgan Kirkland, News Channel 7. Bradford was actually released from Health South on December the 12th. Our next story made national headlines this fall when it first broke and when it came to an end in Panama City Beach. Two convicted killers who were mistakenly released from a panhandle prison using forged court documents. News Channel 7's Adam Klotz has our ninth story in the countdown. Convicted murderers Joseph Jenkins and Charles Walker were released from the state prison in Franklin County after prison officials received early release court documents. They released one of the men in late September, the other in early October. It took a few weeks for authorities to discover the documents were forgeries. We are very confident in the procedures that we had. However, it's pretty evident that with two inmates being released, uh, due to fraudulent orders, uh, that there was a gap in that process somewhere. Authorities searched for Jenkins and Walker for several weeks. Then, on October 19th, Bay County Sheriff's investigators received a tip that the two men were staying at the Coconut Grove Inn on Front Beach Road, waiting on a friend to pick them up to take them to Atlanta. A motel guest shot this cell phone video showing 20 members of the U.S. Marshals Fugitive Task Force surrounding room 227. There was just a pool in between us, so it was, it was pretty scary. You didn't know if we, we tried to go outside during it, we weren't allowed, we got told to go back inside. So it was, it was pretty scary, especially being there without knowing that murderers are actually in the same hotel that you're in. Jenkins and Walker were alone, they were unarmed, and they were apprehended without incident. Jenkins and Walker are once again back in prison, serving their life sentences, and now with the additional time for their escapes. Adam Klotz, News Channel 7. On December the 19th, Florida Department of Law Enforcement officials charged a total of six people with a total of 37 charges. Authorities say they were all involved in the forged document scheme that led to the escapes. As of January 1st, millions of Americans will have health insurance, like it or not. But it took a lot of time and trouble for most of them to get it. News Channel 7's Brian Gregg has our number eight story, Obamacare and its local effects. Bay County actually benefited from the Affordable Care Act when General Dynamics opened a call center in the old Sally May facility, hiring more than 1,000 people to answer questions about the program. Then problems began when open enrollment began on October 1st. People could not get onto the website healthcare.gov, and those who could didn't have much luck registering for insurance coverage. Talk show host Sean Hannity called the local General Dynamics Center and got customer service rep Erlene Davis. He asked me why was uh, people not able to get into the system and I read him the script because it was a script for everything. Well, I've been having trouble getting on the website. Davis's managers fired her for talking to Hannity. The next day Hannity offered Davis a year's salary, $26,000, that she ironically said she planned to use to buy health insurance for her children. President Obama took more criticism after insurance companies started canceling customers' insurance policies, blaming Obamacare. Local boat captain Bob Zales's insurance company canceled his plan because it didn't meet maternity and pediatric coverage. I'm sitting here thinking, I've got insurance, I've had insurance forever, I'm good to go. 
I've had a lot of friends tell me over the past several months, your insurance fixed to get canceled. No, no, the guy said if you had it, you'd keep it. Well, two days ago, I found out, no, you can't keep it. So clearly, the man lied. But some are benefiting from Obamacare, receiving tax credits towards their monthly health insurance premiums and subsidies for deductibles, co-payments, and total out-of-pocket expenses. Brian Gregg, News Channel 7. Now because of the website issues, the government has extended the open enrollment sign-up period until March the 31st. And number seven in our countdown is the story of a girl who did something pretty remarkable. She single-handedly managed to get her father to the emergency room. News Channel 7's Tiffany Huertas has a story of Asteria Smith. In mid-August, John Smith was picking up his nine-year-old daughter, Asteria, from her karate class when things began to go astray took my daughter to karate class and we was there <clears throat> and uh, Rhett as class was winding up I just felt stopped feeling a little weird not a headache per se but not feeling myself. Hysteria noticed something wasn't right. I start thinking to myself well what's wrong with him? He's not fussing and telling me how to do this and telling me how to do that. So then we had gone to the car and he was mumbling when he told me we, where we were going. And so he was, he was walking really fast. And I'm like, what was happening, what's happening? Then the situation took a turn for the worse. He told me that he couldn't see and then he gave me his phone but he didn't tell me who I needed to call. Hysteria quickly figured it out, driving eight blocks to Bay Medical Sacred Heart. He was fighting with me, and I couldn't t make the turns that I needed to do. And um, he was pressing his salary. I was behind him right here, reaching over him, driving with one hand. And um, I had hit a curve, and um, we almost drove into the front of the ambulance. But they made it. So. I just took it at here as a journey. So we're on a journey. We're on a journey. It's a good journey. Tiffany Huertas, News Channel 7. The doctors discovered a tumor on the left side of John Smith's brain that affects his speech, memory, and his vision. That tumor is growing, and John is undergoing chemotherapy. Partisan politics prevented Congress from passing a new budget before the old one ran out back in the fall. The bickering forced a government shutdown, affecting thousands of people here in the Panhandle. News Channel 7's A Mile West has our sixth story in the countdown. When Flyby Coffee opened in June, the owners were counting on a lot of business from Tyndall Air Force Base. Almost all of our business comes from Tyndall. A lot of airmen and um, workers come from out there. Martinez was serving about 150 customers a day. Then came the government shutdown in October. I've been really slow today. I've had maybe two people since I've been here. The shutdown occurred because Republicans wanted to cut funding to Obamacare and Democrats refused to cut spending. So they refused to pass the federal budget. And the average American business owner, government worker, and consumer bore the brunt of the consequences. Civilian employees at Tyndall Naval Support Activity stayed home. That affected local defense contractors. The Head Start program was affected. Bay County Early Education and Care had to operate without its usual federal grants. It all depends on how long the government is shut down because if our grant year runs runs out uh, in November and things are still going on, then we're all in deep trouble. After 16 days, Congress passed a budget and the government reopened. But Fleege says her program did not receive the same level of grant money and is now serving 17 fewer children. Amila West, News Channel 7. Earlier this month, both the House and the Senate passed a bill to fund the federal government for the next two years, avoiding the threat of another government shutdown coming up next spring. Number five in this year's top ten of 2013 also made national news. Americans glued to their TVs for six days, waiting to see what would happen to a little boy held captive in an underground bunker. News Channel 7's Bergen Balkum has the story of the Midland City, Alabama standoff. The standoff started on January 30th. Jimmy Lee Dykes walked onto a school bus full of children in Midland City and opened fire. He killed bus driver Charles Poland, grabbed five-year-old Ethan Gilman, and retreated to an underground bunker on his property. For the next six days, SWAT teams, FBI agents, and local police negotiated with Dykes to make sure Ethan was safe. 
He has attention deficit hyperactive disorder and Asperger's syndrome. All communications and supplies pass through a six-foot PVC pipe. Until day five, negotiators appeared to be making progress, but that changed. In the past 24 hours, negotiations deteriorated, and Mr. Dykes was observed, was, was observed holding a gun. Around 3 p.m. on the sixth day, witnesses heard gunfire and explosions on Dykes property. Then, silence. Nearly eight hours later, authorities did confirm Dykes was dead and Ethan was rescued, but not much else. We still don't know how Jimmy Lee Dykes died. We don't know if he shot himself. A lot of people reported hearing a really loud boom, two loud booms and gunshots. The next day, information began to flow. FBI agents fearing the child was in imminent danger entered the bunker and rescued the child. Agents shot and killed Dykes, but not before he opened fire on them. Investigators say the bunker itself was booby-trapped with explosives. Happy birthday, dear Ethan. As for Ethan, all of Midland City celebrated his sixth birthday just two days later. Bergen Balkum, News Channel 7. Ethan has since returned to school and is reportedly doing well. Back in April, the local community was shocked by a vicious attack on a seven-year-old Callaway boy. The aggressors two dogs. News Channel 7's Nisa Wilkins has our number four story of the year, the attack on Tyler Jett. On April 3rd, seven-year-old Tyler Jett was riding his bike in front of his home on Kelly Court when two neighborhood dogs attacked him. Paramedics arrived to find the boy did not have a pulse. Then they took him to Bay Medical Center, then to Sacred Heart in Pensacola, where Tyler was listed in critical condition. Neighbors immediately came out against the two dogs. They come through our house. They were uh chasing kids down the street and uh, I made contact with Animal Control and Bay County and told them that if they don't get out here I'm going to shoot their dog. Animal Control had cited the owner Edward Daniels for previous incidents. They euthanized the dogs. Deputies arrested Daniels charging him with tampering with evidence. Over the next four days the community pitched in to help Tyner's family participating in fundraisers. My son was attacked by a bulldog last year and um, and I just want to let the parents know and let all the family know that it will get better. You know, I have a living proof right here that uh, they can bounce back. But it was not to be. Tyler died early the next morning. Bay County Sheriff's investigators charged Daniels with manslaughter. The community continued to support the family as they prepared to bury the seven-year-old, gathering at their family home for a candlelight vigil. Hundreds attended the funeral. In August, Daniels went on trial for manslaughter. After several days of testimony and two hours deliberation, the jury came back with a verdict. We, the jury, find as follows as to the defendant, Edward Daniels Jr., as to count one in this case. The defendant is guilty of guilty as charged of manslaughter. It won't bring Tyler back, but Tyler gets justice, and um, I feel bad for his mom and dad, too. Nisa Wilkins, News Channel 7. Circuit Judge James Fensom sentenced Daniels to 10 years in prison, followed by five years probation. He cannot own or live in a household where there are dogs. You know, many Northwest Florida residents spent the 4th of July treading water and they weren't swimming in the Gulf. Record downpours flooded the western half of our viewing area. News Channel 7's Christina Peffer has the number three story of this year's countdown. The entire first week of July was rainy. But on July 4th, the skies opened up. As much as 20 inches of rain fell during a two-day period. Bay, Washington, Walton, and Okaloosa counties all experienced major flooding on roadways. Some fared better than others. In Bay County, cars stalled and some drivers ended up in ditches because they couldn't tell where the roads were. South Walton experienced the same issues. And the flooding trapped many residents around Edgewood Terrace in their homes. We've gone down a bit. Somewhere in the system below us toward the bay is opened up, it looks like, and dropped, as you can see down there, a couple of inches. There was also flooding along Highway 98, 331 South, and 30A. The rains took out a land dike on the intracoastal waterways at the Bay Walton County line. That shut down shipping traffic for several weeks. But Washington County, with hundreds of miles of dirt roads, suffered the most damages in the area. We've had uh, 21 homes impacted by the recent floodwaters, seven structures were roof damaged, and we're trying to get some tarps now for the people to cover up the roof. Uh, 
all dirt roads have been impacted in Washington County. Months later, many communities are still picking up the pieces. Christina Peffer, News Channel 7. Washington County is still trying to repair $13 million worth of damages. Our next story involves a former Panama City firefighter accused of a very public murder. It happened in a Panama City shopping center parking lot in the middle of the day. News Channel 7 Sonica Dange has the second biggest story of the year's countdown. March 19th started out as a typical lunch hour at the businesses and restaurants in the 23rd Street Plaza until the normal hustle and bustle was shattered by gunshots. Panama City Police say 41-year-old Joseph Moody fired nine shots at his former girlfriend's car in the shopping center parking lot. One of the bullets hit 24-year-old Megan Pettis in the head, another hit her leg as she desperately tried to drive away, smashing into three cars. I'm thinking about my daughter that I have that's about that age. I'm just beyond upset. I'm not even going to go to work. It just makes me nervous to know that in broad daylight here in Panama City that someone would just take out a gun and just randomly shoot. Pettis died from her wounds a few days later. The city suspended Moody from the fire department and Make prosecutors it, uh, upgraded his charges to murder. Firefighters, police officers and public employees as a whole um, are held to a higher scrutiny. We're not happy about it. You know, our thoughts and prayers are, are with the victim and her family. It's all, anything you say can will be used against you uh, yeah, yeah. On April 16th, a grand jury indicted Moody for first degree murder. Then on uh, August 8th, Judge Michael Overstreet declared him mentally incompetent uh, it, to stand it, trial. Would you be more confident if he had uh, an additional number of months to, uh, to solidify this treatment protocol? If he had treatment that led to significant improvement in anxiety and depression, his competency level would improve. And friends and family of 24-year-old Megan Pettis are still waiting for the justice. Sonica Dange, News Channel 7. Moody is receiving treatment at the Florida State Hospital in Chattahoochee until he is deemed competent to stand trial. Well, we are down to the final story in our countdown for 2013. The story that you voted as the tops of the year, and it too made news worldwide. News Channel 7's Cameron Taylor has the story of the two Indiana teens and their parasailing disaster. Two Indiana teenagers decided a parasailing ride would be one of the highlights of their Panama City Beach vacation. It was, but for all the wrong reasons. 17-year-olds Alexis Fairchild and Sydney Good were skirting an approaching storm when the tow rope pulling them through the skies broke. High wind carried the girls toward the Commodore condominiums on Thomas Drive. They smashed into the top story, then tumbled over the side, hitting a power line before landing in a parking lot. Both suffered serious head trauma. Sydney had a severe neck injury, and Alexis had a back injury. The video of the incident went viral. You know, we couldn't do anything. Um, all we could do was, you know, finally get in contact with them after th this happened, and you know, be there for both of them. The girls underwent several surgeries at Bay Medical Sacred Heart before returning to their home, Indiana. There was a national outpouring of prayers for the girls' recovery. Alexis showed great progress in just a few days. She was able to start walking, and as, you know, as soon as she seen Sid, she was in her room, went to hold her hand. Sydney's injuries were more severe. Anytime we get a thumbs up or an acknowledgement to anybody that we, anybody, okay. Uh, it's a shot of adrenaline for us. Coast Guard officials say severe weather and the boat's proximity to shore were major contributors to the accident. The Good family hired local attorney Wes Pittman to represent them in a possible lawsuit against Aquatic Adventures. Cameron Taylor, News Channel 7. Sydney and Alexis were released from Indiana hospitals nearly a month after the accident. Both girls still going to physical therapy and rehab sessions.